Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to many of you. Um, it is an honor uh, for me to introduce James Wellu to a uh, Yale audience. Uh, and it's a treat for me, too, because he's an old friend. Um, we've known each other for most of our careers. And I can tell you that he's been one of the most admired museum people in this country. He began at the Worcester Art Museum as a curator 42 years ago and went on to be director until just five years ago. He's distinguished himself with his acquisitions and his exhibitions and also uh, with his citizenship, his devotion to serving his city and region. He's kept the museum a serious place while at the same time galvanizing support and helping to make it a much more informative and popular museum. And people of our field have admired um, Jim's sort of tenacious loyalty to the Worcester Art Museum, uh, which has meant uh, saying no thank you to offers from other museums, and his commitments to remaining a productive scholar, a lecturer, a teacher, most recently at the Holy Cross, and publishing on Dutch art and other subjects as well. He stands high in the museum field. Um, he's been the head of accreditation at the American Alliance of Museum, the largest and leading professional organization in the country, and he's been the president of the Association of Art Museum Directors. Uh, Jim began at uh, Loras College in Iowa. He got two master's degrees at Notre Dame, went from studio art to art historian, and entered the PhD program at Boston University and finished with a dissertation on Vermeer and cartography. Jim knows more about maps and the art and science of map making than anybody in our field. And he's helped us understand why maps are often so prominent and so strategically placed in paintings of Dutch interiors and what they say about the world they represent. He's also written about landscape and genre painting, still life and other subjects. He's uh, organized exhibitions and catalogs uh, of privately owned paintings in New England collections that he's lured away from their owners. And he was personally responsible for several, exhibition, uh, several exhibitions of international importance, including one of the very fine and neglected painter Judith Leister. Tonight, today, his uh, subject uh, is a contemporary of Judith Leister's in Harlem, uh, who had a very distinctive specialty that he'll tell you about. His title is Franz Post, Bringing Home the New World. James Wallou. Well, thank you so much, John. It's great to be here with you and Jock and other people that we've known for so many years in the field. Uh, lure those paintings away from private collectors. Yes, that's what we do, don't we? <laughs> I'm going to have a postscript to this talk to tell you how we got our portrait um, of Franz Post. But um, in any case, we're going to focus on his landscapes. And there is one upstairs in the gallery to look at, part of the Otterlo collection, which I hope you will see. It's a wonderful, small, representative work by this artist who is pretty distinctive. Well, uh, in 1995, the Worcester Art Museum acquired the only known portrait of Franz Post, the first European-trained artist to paint landscapes in the New World. This intimate portrait, and it is small, only about 10 by 9 inches, much big on the screen there, was painted by Franz Hals, the leading portrait painter in Harlem, the town where both artists spent the bulk of their careers. The identification of the sitter is based on a print, the image in reverse, of course, shown here, which bears a French inscription that translates Franz Post, painter of Prince Moritz, governor of West India. Franz Post was a young man when he had the opportunity to travel to Brazil with Prince Johann Moritz, the Dutch colony's newly appointed governor. There for seven years, from 1637 to 1645, Post captured for Europeans their first images of the American landscape. So who was this Dutch artist who came to the New World at the start of his career? In fact, little is known of Franz Post's early life. Only two years old when his father died, his father a stained glass painter, Franz Post appears to have been greatly influenced by his older brother, Peter. 
who was not only a painter, but also one of Holland's leading architects. It was surely his brother Peter who recommended Franz to Prince Moritz when he was working on plans for the prince's new residence, which the prince would occupy upon his return from Brazil. This handsome building in the center of The Hague, known as the Moritz House, yes, many of you know it, is now the home to one of Holland's finest art museums, including its royal collections. Born in Harlem in 1612, Franz Post grew up in a period of relative peace. The Twelve Years' Truce, established in 1609, brought a lull to the many battles between Spain and the Northern Netherlands during the Dutch drive toward independence. It was an opportune time for Holland to expand its international trade. The Dutch East India Company, established a decade before Post's birth, soon had ships circling the globe, especially to Asia and Africa, contributing significantly to the country's economic growth. In 1621, the West India Company was established, bringing a greater focus to exploration and trade in America, which until then had been the domain of the Spanish and the Portuguese. When the Dutch defeated the Portuguese to gain control of major areas in the northeast of Brazil, the man chosen to oversee the territory was, of course, Prince Johann Moritz. Well educated and of noble descent, Prince Moritz saw his appointment as a chance to explore and document this foreign land. It would help further his connections with Europe's elite, who were obsessed with the exotic, which they were eager to record and also collect as seen in the many curiosity cabinets of the day. And here we have one from mid-century, and you can find almost anything in that room <laughs> from all over the world, from turtles to bears to armadillos, uh, lizards, uh, shells, you name it. Uh, these rooms are really the beginnings of our science museums, just as similar rooms in which they assembled works of art known as Kunstkammers became the, be the beginnings of our art museums. Since most of Holland's trade up to this time had been to the east, the chance to investigate South America was particularly exciting for the governor general. To carry out his mission, Prince Morris assembled a team of scientists and artists, including the 24-year-old Franz Post, to travel with him to Brazil to record, quote, everything that was strange. <laughs> Sounds like a teenager, doesn't it? <laughs> Franz Post's task was to document the terrain and various structures then under Dutch control. The other lead painter to accompany the prince was Albert Eckhout, and these two artists had Jungens with them, assistant painters or artists as well. Eckhout's assignment was to record the local Brazilian population, as in these two life-size portraits. Eckhout was also charged with documenting Brazil's many exotic animals and plants. The best example at this time of the Dutch obsession with the unusual was their fixation on the tulip, which always surprises people who, not that familiar with the Holland, is not native to the Netherlands. It is the symbol of Holland, of course, but it was brought from Turkey only at the end of the 16th century. This mania for tulips quickly led to tulip bulbs selling for astronomical prices, often exchanging hands several times in a single day. In fact, just as Prince Moritz and his crew were boarding the ships to sail for South America, tulip bulbs realized their highest prices, a single bulb selling for as much as the price of a townhouse in Amsterdam, or 10 years of salary for a common laborer. By the time Moritz and his crew arrived in Brazil, some two months later, Holland's craze for tulips had its first great test of reality with the now famous crash of the tulip market. <clears throat> and all you economists know that term, tulipomania, the first really great speculative bubble. Still, the Dutch thirst for the exotic was unquenchable, and the newest opportunities lie to the West, which Franz Post was about to witness firsthand. Unfortunately, we know of no drawings or paintings by Franz Post before he left for Brazil, which is when his generation of Harlem painters were contributing significantly to the development of landscape painting. This depiction of the dunes near Harlem from about 1633, painted by his older brother Peter, gives us an idea of the kind of realistic landscapes being produced in Harlem at that time. And here you can see in a rather limited palette, mostly browns and greens, the artist is able to carry us from the foreground into the very distant future across the dunes 
and probably going into the North Sea there. The earliest known works by Franz Post are sketches made en route to and during his stay in South America. It is estimated that Post made hundreds, if not thousands, of drawings, though less than five dozen are known. While in Brazil, he painted at least 18 landscapes, only seven of which are known today. The earliest of these oil paintings is a view of Itamaraca, an island in northeastern Brazil, now the state of Pernambuco. Here two Europeans, perhaps Portuguese, since they were there first, are shown with their black slaves, elegantly positioned along the shore. From what we know of the slavery conditions, the depiction of the slaves is somewhat romanticized, whereas the, the terrain reads like a map. A comparison of this work with the landscape by Peter Post shows how his younger brother was, however, able to apply the realism of Harlem School to at least the landscape. One of Post's most attractive landscapes of Brazil is entitled the Oxen Cart, at least of those that were painted in Brazil, which the artist signed and dated very specifically August 15, 1638. This was a tradition back in Harlem, too, to get dated to the day. Here, Franz Post again presents an idyllic image of slaves who were an integral part of the Dutch sugar industry, while Post presents us a beautiful an apparently accurate view of the land, we are given no hint of the slaves' actual working conditions, which were often deplorable. Two years into his stay, Post completed a painting focused on the San Francisco River, one of South America's longest waterways, and they have some of the largest, longest, and one that runs entirely in Brazilian territory. Here the expanse of the river is framed by a giant cactus on the left, and in the center, not to be missed, a furry creature grazing at the water's edge. Native to South America, the capybara is the world's largest rodent. <laughs> In this photograph of a mother and her two cubs, we can appreciate Poss's realistic depiction of this South American animal. One can only imagine how exciting it must have been for Europeans to be introduced to this exotic creature as seen, and this is important, in its natural habitat through his paintings. To appreciate Post's realism, we should compare his work with one by Roland Savarai, a major artist back in Holland, completed a decade earlier. Savarai's painting includes a variety of exotic birds, such as down at the lower right, the now extinct dodo from the island of Mauritius, extinct because the Dutch took too many away, and others, or the turkey, at the upper left there from North America, well known to us, many of which at that time could be found in European menageries. Slavery's, Savarai's renderings of the animals are in fact quite accurate, but the manner of style landscape in which they are presented is obviously imaginary, so apparent when compared with the works by Franz Post. While in Brazil, Post's paintings like those by Albert Eckhout hung in the governor's sumptuous residence, the Freiburg Palace. And this was a home, probably the greatest one in the New World, much like uh, he was building back home in The Hague. When Prince Moritz returned to the Netherlands in 1644, the paintings and numerous exotic objects went from the Freiburg Palace to his newly finished residence in The Hague, the Moritz House, which of course was designed uh, by Post's brother. The stay in South America also resulted in two major publications, and i just show you sheets from each of them. One of the volumes, authored by Caspar Barleus, included a number of engravings based on Franz Post's drawings and some of his paintings from Brazil, such as those seen there on the left, and then the, you see the engravings on the right. Barleus's volume also includes a map of Pernambuco illustrated by Franz Post. The large, colorful vignette of a sugar mill represents the Dutch sugar industry that depended, that depended heavily on slaves being imported from Africa. By the time Prince Moritz was completing his stay in Brazil, Pernambuco alone was exporting, wow, more than 24,000 tons of sugar annually to Amsterdam. And no dentists there around. Well, they had them, but not like ours. 
Meanwhile, Holland's numerous refineries back home produced the majority of the refined sugar consumed in Europe. Brazil was indeed important to the Dutch economy. Post-cartographic vignette, which is based on this detailed drawing, focuses on the technical operations with little attention to uh, the deplorable conditions of forced labor. You can see the artist is really focused, and probably for the governor's sake, on the efficiency of this new equipment, not on the human capital. Here in another drawing by Post, which includes a text, again, the artist focuses on the technical operations in which slaves use the ox, two ox-driven wheels to press the sugar cane before boiling it. Upon returning to the Netherlands, Franz Post settled in his hometown of Harlem and became active in the local painter's guild. The stay in Brazil would prove a golden opportunity for Post, who soon made a niche for himself with his detailed landscapes of the New World. Working from the many sketches he had made in South America, he was able to produce, at least in the beginning of his career, realistic depictions of the, brilliant, of the Brazilian landscape, if not always accurate regarding the colony's working conditions. Paintings like this completed shortly after Post's return must have been made a great impression. Undoubtedly painted from sketches, this view of the Palo Afonso waterfall is extremely convincing in its depiction of the rushing water. Post seems to have quickly gained a clientele for his new world images. This work, signed and dated 1649 on the palm tree at the right, attests to the artist's skill in not only capturing the South American landscape, but also featuring native vegetation and animals, such as the pineapple plant and anteater, prominently positioned in the foreground. Here in the detail, we see the pineapple and some birds in the foreground and can appreciate the artist's ability to take the viewer far into the distance of this hilly terrain. In this work from the same period, Post provides a new world setting for an Old Testament subject. This is rather unique in his career and the subject is the sacrifice of Manoah. His arrangement of vegetation, which includes banana and papaya trees and a cactus plant, form a repertoire on the left for the biblical figures which were done by another artist. We're still trying to determine who. And not to be missed, and this becomes almost a signature of the artist, at the lower left, one of the creatures from the New World, an armadillo. I'm sure this is what sold the painting. <laughs> this painting here, featuring a plantation house while seemingly accurate regarding the building and the vegetation, is again an idyllic image of slavery. While two Europeans converse on the veranda, a number of slaves are shown dancing on the right, a far cry from their probably normal conditions. By 1655, the date of this work, Franz Post had made a name for himself with his unique images of America. It was about this time that Post sat for the portrait of, by Franz Hals. With his hat on and his arm over the back of a chair in an informal pose invented by Hals, Post, now in his early 30s, exudes a sense of confidence and satisfaction. At age 50, Post completed one of his most brilliant works, now at the Rijksmuseum, entitled View of Olinda Cathedral. The Jesuit church in the distance, somewhat in ruins, reminds us how long the Europeans had already been there, uh, is still being used. The brilliant blue sky overhead is set off by a large repertoire of dark vegetation at the lower left particularly, in which a variety of indigenous animals find shelter. Here, this detail shows an anteater, a sloth, an armadillo. If you look further to the right, you can probably make out a monkey, a rather unusual animal in his paintings, but the anteater was certainly a favorite, almost a signature. The carved wood frame that was made for this painting, a section of which you see here, was undoubtedly inspired by Post's sketches for it includes all kinds of foliage, fruit, insects, and reptiles from America. Post was not the only painter to create a market for images based on his travels. Numerous Dutch artists who had ventured to other parts of the world were specialized, often specialized in paintings based primarily on their times away from Harlan looking at their sketches. Many of these artists took great liberties in composing their paintings, as seen in this view of Rome, painted by Johannes Lingelbach after his return to the Netherlands. 
After all, if you had never been to Rome, you wouldn't know the difference, right? <laughs> but those of you who are familiar with the eternal, eternal city will soon realize <clears throat> that this painting brings together on one street elements from different sections of the city. The large sculpture of the Dioscuri is from the Capitoline Hill, and there it's pushed in at the position at the beginning of the Via Babuino, whereas other um, uh, sections are correct, like the uh, Centrita do Monte at the top of the hill, right at the top of the Spanish stairs, where I'm sure many of you have spent some time. Such was the case with many of Post's later works, <clears throat> as in this painting, another of his more popular subjects, the sugar mill. As seen in this detail, Post romanticized images of this major industry so dependent on the slave trade were no incentive for the folks back home to disapprove of working conditions of their country's major industry in the New World. Franz Post continued to paint exclusively New World subjects until his death in late, the late 60s. His later works become rather weak, and we think he suffered from alcoholism. But in 1679, the year before he died, before Post died, Prince Moritz presented to King Louis XIV, the greatest of the land at that time, the bulk of his Brazilian collection, which included 27 paintings from Franz Post. Some of those I showed you, and to see them today, you can visit the Louvre. By the end of his life, Franz Post had clearly made a name for himself, especially among those who, during the great age of exploration and international trade, were extremely fascinated by the foreign, the exotic, and the strange. His paintings and drawings of the New World, including the numerous engravings made from them, were to influence generations of Europeans well into the following century, even into the 19th century. Realistic on the one hand, but often romanticized on the other, post paintings and drawings are decidedly a 17th century European view of the New World. For us in the 21st century, the works by Franz Post are not only a window onto Brazil's colonial days, but also a vivid record of the aspirations, the sense of adventure, and the deep curiosity of the Dutch during their country's golden age. Well, um, you can see one of the works, and I'm sorry for the slide, it's not as sharp as the original. It's upstairs, a small work by uh, Franz Post, and this is part of the Otterlo collection. And it's 1663, so it's right when Franz Post is well known. And you can see, again, a rather idyllic image of slaves in the foreground. Uh, some of the buildings, which, as John and I were just looking at it, remind you of the age of Brazil, with the Europeans being there, and some of these buildings now in ruins already. So I thought I might share with you, as a postscript, uh, a little bit now about uh, our painting by Franz Post, a, a, Franz, a portrait of Franz Post by Franz Hals. There you see it in a frame which I had made uh, at the, um, in Harlem, his hometown. When we acquired it, it was in a, a gold frame, which sort of killed the picture uh, and was obviously added at a later time. So how did the Worcester Art Museum acquire the only known portrait of Franz Post? Like so many paintings from Holland's Golden Age, it has had an interesting route to its current home. And it's not that far away. You can come see it. <clears throat> By the 19th century, don't directors of museums do this all the time, John? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> By the 19th century, it is recorded in the collection of John Walter III, whose grandfather founded the London Times and who himself managed the London Times. An avid collector of Dutch paintings, Walter kept the painting at Bearwood one of England's largest Victorian homes. By the 20th century, it had come to America, to an equally grand home, that of P.A.B. Widener, one of our country's greatest collectors of old master paintings. Uh, this is a family that made its money on the, in the meat industry during the Civil War. The painting was, um, you can see, in this great estate, which still exists, Linwood Hall in Elkin, uh, Elkins Park in Pennsylvania. The painting was included in the large volumes documenting the Widener collection, much of which eventually ended up as a gift to our National Gallery by Widener's descendant. But Franz Howell's portrait of Franz Post was not to be among them, for it was sold by Mr. Widener in 1923. The reason for the sale, as best I conclude, appears to be the traces of his signature on the painting, which apparently proved to be false. 
an FH, which someone must have added later. The painting, and I thought John Walsh would enjoy this because we both come from the Midwest. I think John spent a lot of time in Davenport where your grandfather lived, and I grew up in Dubuque, Iowa. Well, the painting went to the Midwest, and I know many of you Englanders don't know Iowa, but um, when I first came to Boston University, now you know it because of the caucuses, but um, <clears throat> when I first came to um, Boston University, an older lady asked me, where are you from? I said, Iowa. Oh, we pronounce that Ohio out here. <laughs> <laughs> then when I insisted that I knew where I was from, <laughs> she said, are you sure you don't mean Idaho? <laughs> you know, by that time you just give up. But on the other hand, I do like to remind <laughs> you New Englanders, and I love New England, that except for Maine, you could put all of New England into Iowa. And then, then people always ask, why don't we know of it? <laughs> well, uh, in any case, it was in Iowa that this painting uh, went to at the early 20th century, and it remained for mo most of the, the century. First in St. Paul, there's the red dot up on the beginning of the Mississippi River. Then in Davenport, where I think John, your grandfather lived, right? Uh, just <laughs> an hour down the road, down the river from Dubuque, Iowa, where I grew up. I could have seen this in my youth. It was there in Davenport <laughs> when the owner passed away that the great Franz Howe scholar, Seymour Sly, finally got to see the painting. In his usual jovial manner, Professor Sly once told me he had to step over a dead body to finally see a work he knew only from photographs. <laughs> once Sly confirmed that the painting was an original by Franz Hals, it was included in the 1989 major exhibition of Franz Hals at the National Gallery in DC, which then traveled on to London and, very appropriately, the Franz Hals Museum in Harlem, the hometown of both the sitter and the painter in this case, where it remained for possible acquisition. <clears throat> I first saw the portrait of Post at the National Gallery. Obviously, I admired it. This was when the Worcester Art Museum was embarking on the first exhibition, as John mentioned, of Judith Leister, who had never had a, a show uh, ever. Um, she died in 1660, and from the time she died until the end of the 19th century, all of her works were attributed to male artists, and then after that she became a catch-all for works by Franz Howells. She's Holland's most famous woman painter, who was a, a great follower of Howells and Howells' brother Dirk Howells. And we were beginning to organize a show uh, with the Franz Howells Museum. Worcester's extensive collection of 17th, Dutch, 17th century Dutch art represents many of the masters from the Golden Age, including one of the few works by Leister, but unfortunately up to then, not a work by Howells. Naturally, he was high on our list of possible acquisitions if the right work came along. Well, it did, but in a curious way. And bear with me, but this is how things happen. It was in 1994 that I went to visit my sister and brother-in-law who had just moved to Prague after the wall came down, uh, starting a law office there. And uh, as soon as I arrived, my brother-in-law handed me a bunch of faxes, remember those? <laughs> And one of them was from a dealer in London, and it said, what do you think of number 77 in the recent Franz Howells exhibition catalog? Well, I don't know the paintings by the numbers. But I called uh, Mark Weiss, a dealer in London, who specialized mainly in Elizabethan portraits. And we had just bought a painting from him, an Elizabethan portrait from the 16th century. Um, I called him on the phone from Prague. Uh, and he said, I have the opportunity to buy a painting by Franz Hals of Franz Post. Do you know the painting? I said, I know it quite well now, but I know the Franz Hals Museum is trying to buy it. He said they had to give up on it because not everyone accepted the small portraits by Franz, Franz Hals, including uh, one of the German scholars. This put the kibosh in it for my colleague Peter Biesboer, uh, the um, uh, uh, curator of the Franz Hals Museum, whom I had worked very closely with on the Judith Leister show. The show was held at Worcester and in Harlem. Well, I could just imagine how frustrated Peter was. I got on the phone immediately to him and I said, what's the deal? And he said, we've tried, but because not all the scholars in the world agree with this attribution, we know that Slive is behind it and we've examined it in the lab, Jim, there is no question about it. We can't get the city funding. It's the advantage of being a private museum. In any case, 
uh, he said, so if you can get it, um, do so. But before I talked to him, as I was on the phone with uh, Mark Weiss, in the door walks this gentleman, and he was a gentleman. This is Professor Nelson Goodman from Harvard, who founded Project Zero at Harvard, a uh, great philosopher of the 20th century, whom I got to know quite well. He was a collector his whole life, but had not focused on Dutch and Flemish paintings, but when we met, we started collecting in that area. <coughs> uh, Nelson Goodman was on his way to the Maastricht Fair, which occurs at this time of the year, annually, and I was gonna meet him there to look at paintings that he might buy. Well, the odds for him to walk in the door when I'm on the phone with Mark Weiss, and Mark said, oh, a friend of you just came, uh, yours came in the door. I said, put him on the phone. <clears throat> so I did. I said, Nelson, Nelson, <laughs> you got to put a reserve on this painting. He said, well, I'm not that big of a fan of Franz Howells, but you sound desperate, so I'll do that. <laughs> we met up at the Maastricht Fair. I went to Berlin, studied up as much as I could further on Franz Howells. I had been looking for one, so I was you know, quite familiar with his work. Uh, and um, then we both re-met in London. I will never forget that time because by the time we got to London, Mark Wise had other buyers for this painting, including clients who were going to buy more than one painting. <clears throat> and I said, but you have a deal with Nelson. He said, you're right, you're right, but you have to make up your decision in uh, the next two hours. <laughs> so I said, Nelson, and Nelson is in his 90s by then. I said, we've got to make this decision, Nelson. Nelson said, well, let's go have lunch. <laughs> you know, older people like to do that, right? Well, Nelson, he was very frugal, but generous on the other hand. He had free tickets to a restaurant across town in London. <laughs> it cost us more to get there. Anyway, that was a great lunch, and we convinced him that he should buy it. And I said, I'm sure I can work out that the Worcester Art Museum will buy it, but we just can't act that fast, collections committee, et cetera. So Nelson uh, bought it. And I still remember um, when I called uh, Peter Beesbor and he said, it's a great painting, Jim, and I just don't want an enemy to get it. I want the Worcester Art Museum to have it. So that's how it got to Worcester. And while we do not have a landscape by Franz Post, uh, you can see that upstairs, but to see the only portrait of the artist, you've got to come to Worcester and see also our great collection of Dutch art. Thank you. Any questions? You all want to go to the gallery? Pardon? <laughs> well, <laughs> we had tulip bulbs when we did the Judith Leister show. You know, there are tulip bulbs uh, named for Judith Leister now. And uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Any questions about house or post or Judith Leister? <laughs> Uh, they were because you find them. Um, I don't know about Prince Morris. He did have uh, objects besides paintings and drawings in the Morris house. But um, I think that's the truly exciting part of Franz Post's work because you get to see them in their natural habitat. You can imagine once they're stuffed or dried out or whatever, not as exciting. But there were a lot of them. You see them in the wonder, uh, wonderkammers of the day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of studies, in fact, actually at Holy Cross, there's a professor now working on the uh, dodo bird, um, you know, trying to um, figure out, it was already extinct by the 1630s, I think, um, because people were bringing it back. I think this is the thing that obviously fascinates me the most about Franz Post, the craze for anything that was new and strange, and they had the money to buy it. They had the money to buy it. You know, it's, it's incredible what they would put down for these objects. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for that talk. I was just wondering, um, I noticed in the landscapes that the nature is rendered quite beautifully as if we were standing there. I can't quite hear it. Oh, I'm uh, sorry. Um, I, I first said thank you for the talk. And then um, I was wondering in the landscapes, I noticed that the nature, Post depicts the nature quite realistically as if we were standing there. He evokes the atmosphere of the surroundings, and yet the people are not rendered as um, naturally. And mm -hmm. I was wondering if, I, I believe you mentioned that was a manneristic mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, style, and I was wondering if you could just speak a little bit about why that was the fashion in the 1600s sure. when we had, you know, the idealization mm -hmm. of man in the Renaissance, and mm -hmm. then uh, a hundred mm -hmm. years later, this kind of switch, or, or I don't know if you could just... Good question. Did you all hear the question? Yeah, okay. <coughs> well, uh, I, while we have no early paintings or drawings, as I mentioned by Franz Post, he was clearly uh, coming, uh, coming out of Harlem as a landscape painter. And that's why uh, the prince uh, brought him, because Eckhout could do figures. And, uh, uh, and then you have that painting where you have the, the Old Testament, which shows that he would go to a figure painter. And people really did specialize. It's somewhat amazing when you see you know, maybe an interior scene where the person can do a figure so well and the floorboards are in the, f in the room are crazy. But they, they were really specialists. And, uh, and then I think this romanticizing of the slavery, the life of the slaves, was probably to appease the governor, I'm sure. Uh, I, uh, he does not um, leave us any images of the interiors of the slave quarters, which I'm sure were horrible, horrible. Um, but this would have helped sell the paintings, I'm sure. You know, it's a happy life over there. Uh, there's a lot of scholarship being done now today on this subject, as you can imagine. Uh, but clearly, um, uh, I, I would say that Eckhout's depictions are more realistic, although he makes them look often, as you saw, like European figures mm -hmm, in their stature, etc. Other question? I think you all want to get upstairs to see some Dutch paintings, right? Okay, you're welcome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah.